Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Pazarek, and I'm the chair of the Department of Geography and Tourism Studies at Brock University. On behalf of the department, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's presentation. If you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please type them into the comment box and we'll address the, uh, those questions after the talk. Um, I'd also like to start today's proceedings with a land acknowledgement. So we begin this gathering by acknowledging the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. And acknowledging reminds us that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendship of Indigenous people. So climate change is, is one of the most pressing issues impacting the world today. Across Canada, the average cost per weather related disaster has increased more than 1000% since the 1970s, according to the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices, uh, which is an independent, publicly funded and, and nonpartisan group of experts that come from a, a diverse number of, of different disciplines. In the nine years from 2010 to 2019, there was over $14 billion in disaster costs uh, across Canada, the same amount as over the previous 40 years. In addition, there are numerous long-term impacts for climate change, such as an estimated $1.3 billion cost to dozens of communities across the Northwest Territories due to permafrost thaw. So while Canada may receive some benefits to changing climate, the cost to our economy are likely to out overshadow those benefits. With this in mind, it's my pleasure to welcome our speaker for today, Mr. David Grimes. David is a Brock graduate, completing a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and Physics. David is well known for his contributions to the science and policy of climate change within the federal government in Canada and internationally during the past 40 plus years. David began his career with Environment Canada's Meteorological Service, where he held numerous senior and scientific positions between 1975 and 2006 including the executive director of the Canadian Climate Centre from 1988 to 1992. David served as the assistant deputy minister of environment and climate change Canada for 13 years between 2006 and 2019. In 2011, David was elected president of the World Meteorological Organization, the world's authoritative voice on weather, climate and hydrology. This was the first time a Canadian has held this position. David led the WMO for eight years and advanced numerous priorities to better support the world's policy and decision-making challenges through advances in science and information services. David's career achievements uh, have not gone unrecognized. He's the recipient of several national and international awards, including being named an International Meteorology Laureate fellow of the American Meteorological Society, and in 2020 was named uh, a member of the Order of Canada. David now spends much of his time as a senior consultant to the World Bank Group and chief executive of Grimes Consulting Group. So it's my pleasure to welcome David Grimes to speak about climate, politics, and science, obstacles, relationships, and responsibilities. So go ahead, David. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, and thanks for the uh, opportunity for the next uh, 40 minutes or so of sharing a perspective on um, uh, climate politics and science. And so um, it's been uh, recognized uh, it today as the most significant political challenge of our time. I know our the, today with COVID and, and the concerns about COVID, there's uh, a, a, uh, emphasis on that is an extremely important issue for uh, global society. But in terms of the long term, uh, climate change is uh, has been uh, recognized. I'll speak to that a little bit later. Um, the signal, signal, and I'll also highlight 
that it, it's been unequivocal. Uh, it's extremely clear about the, um, the anthropogenic uh, aspects that have influenced our climate system. It has uh, far-reaching consequences, and Mike has kind of highlighted a few of those, and I'll speak to uh, that as well. It's uh, also considered as one of the biggest threats to global security. Um, David Attenberg, who is a renowned um, um, naturalist, was addressing the UN Security Council, and he couldn't help in his uh, presentation, Security Council, he highlighted how significant uh, this is, not just to global security in a sense of civil uh, dimension, but also from the point of view of our dependency on our food sources and the ocean food chain and um, uh, our access to fresh water and biodiversity. And a key question, which I'm going to address during this talk, is why. Um, uh, why is this a, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm just going to have to pause for a second, get rid of that. Um, figures, there it is, back. There we go. And so um, in terms of uh, the graph on the right really just shows a um, the over uh, the decadals from the 1880s forward what the uh, warming signal is in 2020 is uh, tied officially um, as the warmest record warmest on record uh, tied with 2016. So um, a little focus on what is natural and anthropogenic forces that drives today's climate. So uh, we hear a lot about, so what, how, what are the main factors that influence our climate? And of course, uh, one of those factors is natural climate variability. And these are, you know, small changes in the sun's energy, seasonal changes due to its orbit and some interaction with natural changes and uh, for instance, uh, interaction with the ocean and, and atmosphere, and then also volcanic eruptions. And there was in the late, in the late seventies, we had Pinatuba, which, you know, cooled the uh, global atmosphere by almost two degrees. So these factors are important, but they're all part of the natural cycle of the earth. The anthropogenic climate drivers are related to the emissions of heat trapping gases. And this also shows and this is a consequence of change in land use that reflect most, more or less, of the sunlight's energy. And this has been in place, I mean, since about 1750, we can go back and start to see the human influence on the climate system through some of the science studies that have been done over the last um, 300 years. So um, climate science, um is you know driving our understanding of the earth's climate through observations experimentations scientific theory and computational models and so uh, the first part of my talk is really just going to talk about how science has been the bellwether of global warming so in 1857 john tyndall um who was a um a physicist had uh was doing some studies with around the um on greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, he called it carbonic acid, and looked at the uh, consequences. And he could, he, he was the first to actually demonstrate that by increasing carbonic gases in a, in a chamber, you could actually increase these, this temperature, the, the, the warming, the, the warming. And the second uh, aspect was by Savanta, our Hernanius, who was uh, also a physicist, 1889. And in, he was doing the first kind of atmospheric related uh, experiments related to uh, global warming. And in his perspective, a doubling of the percentage of carbon dioxide in the air would raise the temperature of the Earth's surface by about four degrees. And if carbon dioxide were to increase fourfold, then it would be eight degrees. And he showed this kind of correlation. 
and it's interesting in his uh, his perspective of of at that time that recognizing that this might be beneficial to uh, the earth in that some of the colder regions of the earth may you know be able to produce more crops and things um, and there are opportunities but i don't think he saw or foresaw kind of the other uh, consequences in the risks significant risks that it presents to society as we observe today so an integrated planetary uh, uh, observatory um, is uh, the next uh, uh, talk I want to, um, uh, the next uh, slide I'll just touch on a few key things. The first is that we've been monitoring climate it dates back to the 17th century. So um, in Canada, we have um, our first uh, observations were in the uh, Laval area of Quebec and also at the University of Toronto where it currently exists where those measurements date back almost 200 years. In, uh, in Europe they go back uh, to uh, 300 years. In terms of um, um, and they were primarily done in the context of supporting agriculture but also done in the university to try to understand the phenomena of weather as they had had seen it, um, there has been a significant transformation of the climate science with the onset of uh, satellites, which started in you know the late 1950s. But we started with actual um, Earth observing satellites, of which there's about 450 today. Um, in in beginning in the 70s and um, this generates tens of uh, terabytes of data daily um, the other aspect i would want to highlight is that science has a very um is very effective and and actually the world meteorological organization is one of the um uh, conveners i think of the of science particularly in the weather, water, and climate domain. But the International Geophysical Year 1957 was trying to take a baseline of basically the environment in its um, totality, try to understand you know, what, what was going on in, in, from a maritime uh, marine um, bio, uh, biology, for example, and uh, try to understand what's going on in the atmosphere, but looking at the various dimensions of the um, of the uh, planet, with the idea of pr providing a baseline measurement. Um, uh, this uh, it was interesting because one of the key experiments that was established and then kept ongoing was the uh, establishment of Mauna Loa of the um, uh, atmospheric composition monitoring. And this is where we were looking at uh, the beginnings of monitoring greenhouse gases. So records for uh, on monitoring greenhouse gases started in 1957 and they uh, proceeded up till um, um, uh, up to present day. Um, the WMO also sponsored uh, three major um, uh, world climate conferences between 79 and 2009. And this also uh, led to the creation of the IPCC and the uh, coordination of climate research. And it's really important rather than having individual science being done in a somewhat ad hoc way is to have a coordinated science campaign, which was trying, which was focused on trying to understand what was uh, going on with uh, significant change. And also the uh, global climate observing system, which in 19, uh, it, which was part of um, the Rio conference in, uh, and that was the World Environment Summit. Uh, held in Rio in 1992, where the UN Framework for Climate uh, for the Convention on Climate Change, as well as this Global Climate Observing System, was established, which looks at what are the core variables of the climate system that we need to monitor over time to give us a sense of how the planet is changing. So, um, on the left, you see this is a, a 
um, the Mauna Loa, and um, and you can see that the uh, um, measurements lower, which are in the dark red, uh, part of that curve. Um, this was, uh, you can see how that cycle has uh, increased. And on the right-hand side is a map where we have 28 um, global atmospheric watch stations established under the WMO that measures atmospheric composition, greenhouse gases being one of them, black carbon being another, et cetera, to understand how the atmosphere is changing over time. And when we project then what the greenhouse gas, um, what carbon dioxide emission and the, or, or uh, concentration levels are in the atmosphere, they're based on these, uh, this information and the satellite data that now also contributes, uh, contributes to. So um, global emissions, uh, and this comes really from, um, uh, as part of the UN, um, uh, framework convention on climate change has you know required reporting and it shows here where you can see um, the emissions really aren't slowing down um, even in 2020 while there might have been a slight dip there's nothing institutional it's going to change uh, that to continue to increase and you can see that you know there are um, five countries in the world that are um, uh, significant contributors to to that. What is also uh, interesting is uh, that 1% uh, of the richest uh, more than double those of the poorest in terms of contribution, which uh, is an important consideration when you're in a policy discussion because the um, developing nations often look to developed nations as having some privilege of using their resources and develop and, and contributing emissions, which when an, when, a atmos when a molecule of carbon dioxide goes in the atmosphere can last anywhere from, from 60 years to uh, two centuries in, in the atmosphere. And so their perspective is that their uh, opportunity to develop is being um, held back now in the context of the debate, while countries like the United States and Canada and, and many European countries use their resources effectively in order to have their development and create you know, their, um, their prosperity for their people. Um, and that's an important discussion that has taken place in the policy world as they look at solutions. So, um, Science and high performance computing are reducing the uncertainties. So this was, um, you know, when I first started back in uh, it, with Environment Canada, I was uh, a meteorologist, and I um, and and you know one of my jobs was to basically uh, analyze uh, information. We used to plot in a graph, and you see a, a map on the right, which kind of shows the Niagara region for a certain day and the and and that would tell us something about trying to understand the behavior by looking at the interrelationship based on what we understood and what the science was saying and what we were seeing from reality these were foundational steps that were built into climate models uh, or into weather models in the uh, in the 1970s and then supported climate models going forward I still think this is an important aspect of um, of science is that people make the difference in their in their efforts. The other chart is just the second aspect that we did back in those days was time series and looking at the correlation between those to try to you know carry forward understanding. Both those concepts have been built into models, and in the 1960s. Um, based on this kind of study we we were able to recognize the significance of uh, el nino and la nina events and how they had influenced the climate system by looking at that and in the 80s we did this um, uh, tropical ocean um, array of measurements to try to understand the behavior of that that also was supported by the w uh, WMO under one of the world 
um, world weather research programs, which gave us an understanding of that behavior. Today, we monitor the La Nina and El Nino events based on the uh, on satellite data that gives us sea surface temperature. And so all of this kind of gets integrated into climate models that provide us a foundation for understanding what's going. So in the 1970s, it was primarily atmosphere. But by, by today, we've, we have atmosphere, land surface, ocean, and sea ice, um, uh, surface, uh, aerosols, um, uh, non-sulfite aerosols, carbon cycle, and we've been doing research on trying to better understand the carbon cycle and how it how it gets uh, manipulated through the Earth system because it also gets absorbed by ocean. It's not just staying in the atmosphere. And this, this and how it cycles, how it cycles with the impact of the tropical um, the tropical rainforest, for instance, in Brazil, which is huge and it absorbs you know, a good portion of the atmospheric um, uh, carbon dioxide, I can't quite remember what the percentage is, it's in a neighborhood of around 20 or 20, 20 to 25% gets absorbed by the tropical of that one region. So understanding its behavior and integrating that in models gives more confidence in what the models are, are saying going forward. And the, uh, based on that, our performance has, we, we, we've increased the skill of, of our climate models by looking at um, bringing together the earth system research that's being done. And um, I've got to, this is, sorry about that again. And, and the um, idea of looking at, um, at artificial in intelligence and data science and higher resolution modeling made possible by having these, these um, uh, high-speed uh, computers. We use petaflop uh, supercomputers for doing these models. They take anywhere from four to six months in order to like a full set of scenarios. They're based on different um, uh, greenhouse gas scenarios, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And there's about 40 of them around the world, and we use them in a combined way to help us understand where prominent trends are and where there are errors and then where there should be more emphasis on research. So how does a climate model work? And I think this is important. It's, it's not like a weather model that takes, you know, what is today's weather and then use physical factors to understand how it's changing and uh, other other related um, aspects. But it, it looks primarily at um, modeling the current client, climate system, the climate as we know it today, and then perturbs that climate by increasing the number, the amount of greenhouse gas that uh, goes into the atmosphere, and that's done over time. And that behavior then is what drives these different models. And so these climate models will operate with a what would be a two degree forcing. What would this scenario have to look like in order to get uh, something two degrees um, or one and a half? Or what is the current behavior based on current policies, climate policies in place that's looking more like three or three and a half degrees? Then what does that profile uh, would look like? And then this then feeds back into um, some of the policy making with where, where they really need to be in order to get within two degrees or even to one and a half. And so um, I was now I'm gonna switch the policy response to science. I hope you could see that the foundation, the science foundation has been pretty strong over the last 50 years. and um, it, it provides a strong base and it's not about doubting science. Um, insights into the history of um, the political response. And I think for me, there were kind of three dimensions important. I was uh, one of Canada's negotiators for the Kyoto uh, Protocol, 
I also uh, supported the uh, at Rio the UN framework on climate change, uh, and I also uh, participated in the IPCC. Um, in terms, I was a, a secretary for um, a working group three of the second uh, IPCC report, and I was uh, um, uh, represented Canada for the third IPCC report that uh, the the third um, uh, plenary that it's kind of the policy side of looking at what does the IPCC report say and producing a policy summary for the third uh, IPCC report. And for me, the three dimensions that come out of this discussion are um, first, there's a, there's a sense I say not thinking globally and acting in local interest. Um, not everyone is in the same place. And I already highlighted the developing world feeling that they've not had the opportunity to develop while we've spent, you know, uh, 50 to 100 developing in developed nations. Um, the same privilege is not being granted. And this is a significant debate. Um, it's in some parts of the world, climate change is not embraced as a global problem. Um, this is kind of looking back, less so today, but there are um, there are beliefs that science not complete. Um, I would say that's also um, um, not real anymore. I think most policymakers, and we get I talk about um, Paris Agreement, you'll see that that actually um, it's not a question of whether the science is you believe the science or not it's a it's it's a question of how do you go forward in a in a, in a better in a more um let's say in a fair equitable way and that's a challenge in itself um arguments to take action are risky under uncertainty now the precautionary principle highlights that it shouldn't just be uncertainty that holds you back. If you, some things that make sense, you should go out and 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 pursue those. And um, uh, that was a very strong argument used, uh, really, in the '90s. That under uncertainty, why would we challenge, say, our economic systems or economic growth or reduce our GDP, etc.? And then there were campaigns of economic interests, as you've seen in a previous slide, the emphasis that the fossil fuels is a huge contributor to the greenhouse, uh, to greenhouse gases. And as a, as a consequence, um, the oil and gas industry and countries like the OPEC uh, countries have a, um, a large stake, their economy has a large stake in this. And that Introduce some challenges with respect to um, uh, going going forward. So this having a more of a stronger local interest, uh, recognizing national circumstances was the second. It was very prominent. Canada is a very cold country, therefore our demands on energy is going to be higher than, let's say, a tropical country, where um, uh, and as as you get into these debate, economic factors are different. Um, some have better access to cleaner energy sources uh, or hydro facilities, uh, such as Canada is, is really, a, um, it has an advantage in the sense of hydro resources we have access to, um, parts of the world that, that was less at that time, the cost of renewable energy for wind energy, solar energy was very high. Those costs are come way down, very competitive with other um, uh, uh, sources um, uh, today. So th there was that. Then there was also risk and resilience. Some nations were very resilient to disasters and they could, you know, recover. So events that even hurricanes that impact the United States didn't necessarily impact their economy, they were able to save lives and things like this. So their, their degree of risk was, was uh, different. And then 
um, this long-term commitment to a level playing field. A very important uh, point um, to uh, recognize is that um, this is kind of the equitable way. And um, in, I'll give an example, for instance, the long-term commitment is a subject to swings in national policy doctrine and changes to government. So we spent time negotiating the Kyoto Protocol at that time Clinton administration in the United States. And we came away with an agreement and then that um, was changed with um, a, ch a change of president with George Bush and um, they rescinded their relationship with the Kyoto uh, Protocol. To say the same thing happened in Canada with the um, uh, well, uh, Prime Minister at the time Jean Chrétien was uh, supportive of the Kyoto Protocol and the targets that were uh, Stephen Harker, Harper became Prime Minister. Um, the policy shift in Canada moved us away from being, and, and eventually by 2011, we had removed ourselves from, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the Kyoto Protocol. So these long-term commitment to a level playing field are challenging going forward because the circumstances change as uh, we go forward. So the, just on Saturday, and I use this um, slide, it's, you know, the Conservative Party um, policy committee uh, rejected the idea that climate change is real as having it as a statement in their in their policy now it was a close vote it was about 45 46 to 54 something like this but it's a real it makes a statement about um, uh, you know with one political party in Canada and you might ask is it truly a question I don't believe in climate change or is it a question about constituency which was a point i i had on the previous slide the constituency to to which the um the government is supported has a strong it strongly influences kind of the policy priorities of a of, of a government or administration and if you look at that black uh black um graph it's basically the 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 um it's it's looking at energy sources that's that's um, one but the uh, black line is the uh, ghgs for canada uh, by province and you can see that um the the constituency of the conservative party is heavily ba uh, weighted in the west uh, also strong in Ontario, but you can see that that may have had something to do with what happened on the weekend. So um, I think today there's uh, an emerging worldwide commitment to climate action, and I'm just going to spend a, a few minutes and explain why. Uh, primarily, it, climate risks are increasing uh, rapidly, and this is a key point that uh, Michael raised in his introduction but it's also the adaptive capacity to cope is decreasing. Our ability to withstand the consequences or be able to find some resilience to these um, pressures is becoming uh, less. And I'd like to present this in, a, in the context of issue of risk management. This was something that uh, was captured by the IPCC in the uh, in their um, work on extremes, and I'm trying to understand the frequency of extremes and how it relates to um, climate change. Climate change and the issue of risk management. Um, the, the the key aspect here is that the weather and climate extremes are becoming more intense, frequent, and consequential, and yet the collective exposure to these hazards are amplifying due to population growth and we're you know we're approaching 10 billion in 2050 that's a 15 percent increase in population depleting natural resources in a sense that we're using our our natural resources including land and soils not just and also our water resources 
and also made by the choice of where we live. There's 50% uh, of the world live in coastal regions and also what we build. So when we build these very large structures, high rises and um, uh, big buildings, lots of, um, and, and this comes with urbanization, your, your exposure to these hazards increase. And then societies are becoming more vulnerable and that's characterized by how we live. Or in the population, when you look at the population demographics, you see that um, we're, we as a global society are getting older and then sort of the mean age is just, you know, getting older. Um, there's been uh, efforts to alleviate poverty in the world. In doing so, we're building up the middle class and this increases, um, you know, in a sense, the wealth that the average person has, and that becomes, um, increases their vulnerability to, um, to disasters. And then we have growing megacities, development, and um, increasing um, demands on resources. And we have this kind of limited coping and capacity as uh, as we go forward so the policy world or the, the, the political uh, world is starting to see that there's kind of a growing sense of urgency you know we had you know extreme wildfires you know it was record wildfire in in california uh we had wildfires in the uh, above the arctic circle really unusual um and you know we've seen heat waves um you know, and this is increasing loss of life in different parts of the world as well. And they're becoming more pronounced. Since in California, there were 13 uh, consecutive heat waves this summer and uh, extremely unusual uh, as kind of a record. Coastal inundation, storm surge problems, you see increasing droughts, et cetera. The other aspect is that um, in terms of understanding exposure and vulnerability is that I'm just a graphic here of the 20 largest cities and they kind of give you a population growth. You know, do this again. I tried to shut this off. I apologize. Um, but I wanted to uh, just highlight when you, when you look at Tokyo, coastal city, uh, very the, the impacts of uh, sea level rise are significant and, and very prevalent for for that community and they have almost the uh, they have really the population of canada living in that one city in 10 of the 10 largest cities eight of them live in a coastal area which will be affected by sea level rise it gives you a context that this idea of just people are becoming a real uh issue and when you look at it in a, in a global sense, it's uh, hundreds of millions of uh, people will be displaced in the context of sea level rise. The other is Mount Kilimanjaro. It serves about less than a billion people as, as their primary supply of water resources. This is a recent satellite picture of Mount Kilimanjaro. And you can see there's not much snow left on that and we're seeing you know we've seen um uh decreasing uh water resources in uh in lake victoria which is kind of the largest lake in africa and um there are examples some at these sort of major water reservoirs you can see that this has a uh, kind of real consequence so it's turning on lights that we need to do something and the World Economic Forum is a body that uh, is in Davos. It meets every year and it's usually world leaders and, and private sector CEOs and others come and they speak about um, those factors that are influencing global economic development and some societal issues as well. But in the, uh, and this is kind of their lands, global risk landscape where on one side, the left hand side you see that's about impact uh and um, on the um x-axis it would be a livelihood and you can see in the upper uh, right hand quadrant 
uh, all the green dots are environmental risks. Uh, and this then shows you that um, uh, really for the last uh, decade, the, the, the green, the environmental um, uh, factors have been most critical dominant to global economic growth. And uh, this was done by the, um, the R, which is uh, the UN body that looks at disaster risk reduction. And um, they, they were the ones that hosted for Sendai, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And in, in particular, uh, this just shows you that the, um, the cost of damages between the 80s and 2000, the 2000 to uh, 2020. And the graph on the bottom just shows a number of um, I'll call meteorological, hydrologically related disasters. And you can see that, um, you know, we more than doubled our economic costs between the two decades prior to 2000 and, and uh, up, up till now. And um, the number of disasters have also um, almost doubled. So there's, again, increasing uh, concerns. And there's an interrelationship between these factors. They're not all in, inter, in, independent. And for instance, um, climate action failure or extreme events um, have an impact on food, on water, on this uh, human displacement, societal instability, and all these are kind of core factors that uh, influence that. So when we look at 2020, you know, our, our carbon dioxide levels, although that was for 2019, are at our highest level. Um, there, it's been the five warmest years on record. And uh, the precipitation patterns are changing. Um, and and we, we've seen evidence of that. We've seen persistent droughts. Uh, we've seen floods. This is the costliest year on record. 2020 is estimated to cost 210 billion US dollars. In terms of damages, this comes from um, uh, Munich Re uh, and, um, and a UN body that looks at um, as a depository for uh, risk damages. Um, it, it, it's complicated in, in the context that as we look forward, we're gonna see more than half the world you know, experiencing high to extreme water stress. And we're going to uh, have this issue with sea level rise by the end of the century. There are many uh, parts of um, of the coast, the coast in Southeast Asia in particular, that will be um, under threat. And so here's an example, as this graph is shows, it, a map that kind of shows where the water stress is, or where it's expected to be along the sort of major, major river basins. Uh, the red, of course, is the areas that are highlighted. And these are um, populated uh, parts of uh, the world and the dependency on water is significant. This is uh, shows you the variation in food insecurity and climate change. Um, the upper right, um, uh, graph talks about or, or map talks about climate change in present day and the one uh, below it is uh, with measures and the one the larger one on the left is without measures and you can see that without taking action there's going to be some consequence for food security in the world and there was a, a session that go back um, about a decade ago where I had the opportunity to meet with the G20 uh, agriculture ministers. Um, and in that discussion, their concern about food security and particularly the major grains was something of, um, of concern in the context of climate change, but also the demand for food with a growing population at that time being a little over 7 billion and uh, pushing to 10 by uh, 2050. Was there enough uh, resources to, uh, in a sense, food productivity to support that many people? And then this as an in indication of where the economic impacts of climate change are. This was done by this was done by a um, 
uh, an emphasis of looking at um, um, uh, the International Monetary Fund that was, and you can see the Southern Hemisphere is going to have, um, uh, and the tropical region is going to have more of a significant impact than elsewhere. And that kind of brings up this inequity issue that is often part of a policy debate. And finally, in this context, that doing nothing results in an amplification of uh, impacts, which is that, um, you know, with, uh, if we do nothing, then we'll release, release more uh, methane that comes from permafrost and you know this then becomes a cycle it has an impact on on tipping points in the science communities looking at particular tipping points but as one example would be like the amazon rainforest where it's primarily a sink and it could be a source it's the same for the boreal forest as, as um it, uh, you know it, it, you know the dieback that comes as a consequence of uh, changing environment. So all these different studies are kind of feeding feeding back. So I think there's been, you know, in, in 2015 was, a, was a, um, a watershed year for the United Nations. I represented Canada at the Sendai Framework for Risk Management and, the, and I was um, principal of, of the UN at the Paris Agreement and uh, I supported uh, Canada in the efforts of the UN Agenda for Sustainable Development. The Sendai framework is is basically a risk management framework. It's uh, similar to what I've already described in my talk, but it it's identified where there are specific targets. And in particular, there are deficiencies, both in the preparedness and the recovery side. And so Build Back Better kind of came out of the discussions of the Sendai framework. If you're going to build something, then don't build it back in the floodplain or develop your um, uh, standards. And while I was still working for Environment and Climate Change Canada uh, up till um, uh, 2019, uh, there still wasn't a, um, um, in the building codes in Canada, a climate change uh, factor. They were still using in the risk framework and the sustainable development goals. They they are um, both in the point of view of economic, social, and environmental. Really important. There are strategies that are in place that support that in the Paris Agreement is about strengthening the global response to the threat of climate change where countries declare nationally determined contributions. Up until 2020, those contributions represent about a three degree increase. Um, there's a lot of pressure to decrease that. One key point I would like to point out though is that there are new players that are coming in to um, support this and and so the green swan was published by the european central banking um, system and very clear in this that they need to have do a climate change risk assessment against those properties that banks will or financial institutions will um insure let's say or or will uh invest in or even in other projects to which they would invest in but also that the um, uh, uh, their expectation is that they would have some adaptation or mitigation strategy. And we have um, in that context under the UN, there's this global compact, which kind of brings and public stakeholders together to act in a unified way in climate change. There are many countries and many uh, major corporations that have um, declared uh, net zero emission strategies over the next 15 to 30 years. And it's also um, a, um, they, they've, uh, we've established or in the process of establishing carbon trading markets, which will help kind of um, 
creator some of the benefits and equity back into uh, these systems to sort of meet these. So I'm re really optimistic that we're uh, finally moving in the right place. So for me, there's an opportunity for our world to change for the better. Um, this slide is kind of a, all the key actions that have happened since the 70s out to the 2020s that hit, gets us to where we are today and the benefits that we see from the um, six main factors on the left uh, that are sort of driving these kind of positive reinforcing changes. So uh, this is by also by Banksy, who's a, uh, a uh, uh, artist from um, the UK. And I thought this was quite telling. There's always hope. And so for that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. That was great. Um, we have some questions. So I will start off with this first one. Um, major political parties. And so example, the Conservative Party of Canada, the Republican Party in the United States continue to resist accepting the reality and responsibility for greenhouse gas induced global warming. So does this concern you? Um, I, yes, um, it does. But there's, there's a couple of, um, there are a couple of aspects to answer that question. First, um, I pointed out that in early days, there was a, um, the, the, that was a very prominent focus. Change of government resulted in a change of policy or the policy protocol would change. Today, there are so many other influencers that are moving forward. So um, uh, Bayer, for instance, which is a huge pharmaceutical agricultural organization, has committed to a net zero emission strategy by 2050. So I think huge organizations that see themselves not wanting, and this has to do with risk, not wanting to take on the risk of having their assets um, um, sort of decline or, or, or have, have an impact on their own assets and well-being are seeing the importance of factory climate change into their business strategies going forward. And I think that's an encouraging sign. I'd say when I was doing the Kyoto Protocol, it wasn't there. 2015, not really there, but between 2015 and 2020, I've seen this, this prominent focus, even Maple Leaf Foods. And then banking institutions, financial structures are supporting these companies in making that. And I think that's going to be more of a driver in the future. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question is you've sat around the table at many of these international negotiations. Um, it seems like a very complex process. Could you speak to that process and, and how difficult of a process it is to hammer out these uh, sorts of international agreements like the Kyoto Protocol? It, it's complex. There, there, there's no easy answer. I always said if it, things were easy, it would have been solved, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, if there was a pathway. The pathway, because in this sequence, you don't want to say there are winners and losers, but there are some that have that need to give up more than others in these in these debates, the best way to describe it. Um, and in those particular discussions, they become very deep and very well well rooted in um, in their fabric. For instance, in the Middle East, where there are a lot of oil resources, many of the negotiators have very little negotiating room to do anything and you know they'll they they will stand out and say we can't accept this um uh while you can go and have coffee with them and you'd find out it's not that they don't believe in climate change it has all to do with the financial dimension that it has or the social one small island developing states and i've had those conversations their their emphasis is 
our land's going to disappear. And, and I remember, you know, the negotiator from the Maldives said, well, we're just not going to have any land left. And when we don't have any land left, you know, where do we go? And will we be kind of, will we be welcome anywhere? And we're not going to be a sovereign state anymore. You know, this, 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 and this introduces all kinds of complexity. What you have to do is find common ground and you have to do little steps at a time to achieve things. And, um, and from that point of view, we've been successful, but that's why it takes as long as it takes. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, the next one is kind of a little bit sort of broadly um, posing here. What is going to get us out of the climate change conundrum? And can we rely on adaptation to deal with the problem? Um, and do we really have the will, I guess, to implement the necessary mitigation measures? And so is it going to be some sort of combination of adaptation and mitigation? Are we going to rely on one more than the other? Uh, and so kind of what do you think is that pathway to, to get us where we need to go? It, it has to be both. It, it has to be both, but not, it's not an either or question. It, it's a, it, if we do nothing and, and sort of business as usual, we're going to be well with beyond four degrees, four and a half. Uh, the, if you look at that in the context of the ice age, you know, the last ice age was a six degree temperature change. It's not like this is a big shift. Um, losing coastal inundation is going to require societies to move, large numbers of people to move. And um, so not doing any mitigation actually has a, has a very negative context on the fact that a lot of the things that we experience today in the climate will be different. Losing the uh, deep water um, Atlantic uh, thermocline oscillation, having that weaken is going to have a huge impact on the climate in Europe, a huge impact on their productivity in agriculture and other, other domains. So mitigation has to be part of the strategy. I'm encouraged with mitigation because kind of taking uh, place. Adaptation is because we're already seeing the consequences of climate change. We're already seeing evidence that storms are more are brutal. They had record number, well, tied the number of tropical storms in the Atlantic this year. But by far, we had 13, I think it was 13 major hurricanes, um, of which I think there was about six or so that were major, like category four or five hurricanes. These, these are gonna have consequences in a lot of built infrastructure. And when you look at the US, a lot of it's along the coast. So that uh, we need to do both uh, and we need to be committed to both. And I think it's also this, um, I would say the more youthful generation is no longer going to accept, and this is a, you see this in the youth movement, no longer going to kind of accept inaction. And they are also a driver of, um, of these changes. And they are creating the expectation that they want a better world and they're not gonna have that taken away by people who are maybe my age not wanting to take action or, or just look to be reelected. Oh, that's uh, that's great point. And uh, I think there there is a, a sea of change out there um, from the youth today. And, and so hopefully we'll have more action on this as we move, uh, as we move forward. Um, but I think that's a, a great place to end. So thank you very much, David. It was uh, an excellent talk and we appreciate your time uh, and everybody yeah. for, for attending as well today. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, again, thank you.
Okay. Well, thanks very much. I really enjoyed the uh, opportunity.